because as I put this together, it was a very broad topic. Um, so I went into more detail in areas that I think we can all work together and improve, whereas other areas, I feel like anybody can grab a textbook and be as smart as the next person by looking it up. So I might skim over some of those topics a little more quickly. Um, but that being said, if there are questions, I absolutely welcome them as we walk through this. And um, as long as we have a method, we can get them asked and answered. And it, then at the end, there should be time for questions as well. <clears throat> so as I was putting this together, I started to think, what do I mean by reproductive success? And my definition of it is healthy lambs or kids efficiently on the ground at the target time of the producer. Um, if you know we can accomplish any of the steps along the way, but if we don't get to that end product, we haven't succeeded. Um, and, and then along the way, each of those steps we should do well. So the steps that I then broke this down into was achieving pregnancy. Um, and once we do that, we need to maintain that pregnancy. And lastly, we need to get through parturition successfully and have those lambs or kids on the ground live. Um, I lay them out about 40 of my own ewes every year. So, you know, I, I know better or as well as anybody else that if we deliver that lamb and it only lives for a few minutes or we deliver a stillborn, uh, we've done a lot of work for uh, nothing more or less. So getting all the way through all three of those steps to me is really important. So we're gonna today, we'll walk through them and some tips and tricks along the way. Some of this will be review for everybody, but what I've learned in my short 11 years out of school is that uh, review is always helpful. Uh, the fourth year veterinary students in my truck are smarter than me. Uh, they are in the, the, the most current no, and I can look to them a lot. So I know review is a good thing. And then I'll also add in some things that um, we are keeping on the front edge of uh, maybe you guys can pick up and bring back to your practice. So when we start with the first goal of achieving pregnancy, um, what do we need to do in order to get that conception? Um, the first and foremost is having healthy females and males. And this sounds really redundant and unnecessary to say, but I can't tell you how many times people have brought in to me rams that can't walk and they want you know to know why their semen's bad and their semen's perfectly fine, but they're crippled and down on their knees, or they're trying to breed females that are body condition score out of one uh, of one out of five, and they just they don't understand why they're not getting pregnant. And I have to really back the bus up and go down to the basics and say, look, you need to have a healthy animal in order to work on an extra, and an extra is that pregnancy. <clears throat> so what does that mean to be healthy? Again, really, really basic, but things we can't forget to say to our clients. Um, I write this all out in an email when I'm doing advanced repro with these people. And that is an appropriate body condition score is really high on my list. Um, them being sound, because a lot of times if our small ruminants aren't sound, it's because of a disease process. And is that disease process affecting them in a way that's going to um, further affect their fertility? Um, parasite free or a low parasite burden, uh, again, seems redundant or unnecessary to say, but absolutely necessary to say. Uh, mineral deficiencies, I think that gets a little more advanced. I, the majority of our clients probably don't have a mineral deficiency, um, but if everything else is lining up well, uh, should we be looking at that? And lastly, uh, the animals need to be shorn. If we're talking about sheep, um, our, really, our rams that haven't been shorn in three years, probably also haven't had their feet trimmed in three years and they're unlikely to be maximizing. Um, so what I, I like to like really simplify things. So what I say to my clients is think of your producers, your, your breeding age females and your rams or bucks as athletes. And what are we gonna need to do in order to maximize their performance? Um, Body condition scoring is something I like to try to teach my clients about. I'll be the first to admit, I, I don't love body condition scoring. I think it's so subjective. Um, and comparing my body condition score of three to yours is, is probably going to be different. Um, but it does provide our clients a way of evaluating their animals against each other and having an idea if one is obese or one is emaciated and, and how do we get them back to that centralized point. 
Um, so just a quick review, I like to teach the clients of a scale of one to five when we're talking about our small ruminants. Um, and I teach them to palpate along the spine and feel uh, both their transverse and spinous processes um, and, and the effects of wool or hair along them. And I show them there's a variety of different scorecards out there as there are with our cattle, our horses, our dogs. Um, the scales are the same, but the, the ways of looking at it are slightly different. Um, but basically I want some fat covering along that spine all the way from the neck down to the tail. Um, and we, I spend time going over this with them. Um, and then when we break out our ram or our buck specifically, we can add more onto that because obviously we need him to have um, good semen quality and he needs to have a decent libido. I have actually worked on a few rams or bucks that have zero libido despite having great semen and being very healthy and good shape, uh, but they have zero interest in breeding. Um, so that is one thing to have the teacher client to assess. And then doing a breeding soundness exam. I think these are underutilized. I do think we are doing more and more of them and fairly simple for people to do them in the field um, in private practice. And what we want is them to be graded as satisfactory. Um, the hardest part, if you're gonna put this into your practice, if you don't already have it, is collecting that semen using an artificial vagina versus an electroejaculator. We have both here at the clinic and I, my preference is an artificial vagina because the semen is the most pure and accurate reflection of what's going into the female. But a lot of times we have rams or bucks that have stage fright um, and we can't get that sample or we don't have a female in heat and he's just not interested if she's not standing there for him. But that would be my go-to starting point if at all possible. If not, and there's certain clients that just want to jump straight to electroejaculation, and we can do that. Obviously, this is an investment of about $4,500 to start in your clinic. So you have to do a fair amount of these to make that pay off. Um, but it is something that is, if you're doing a fair amount of small ruminants and production type work, uh, could pay for itself. Um, just to, I have to shut my pointer off every time. Let me see if, oh. Let me shut the pointer off. And this is an um, artificial vagina collection of a ram. Um, this female's not in heat, but he's willing to mount her anyway. And this is about as easy as um, a collection can go with an artificial vagina. And in the end, he's produced about a cc and a half of raw ejaculate. Um, so then you can, I typically dilute this out at a one to 10 ratio. And you can look at it simply on a slide that you're doing fecals or looking at skin or whatever you're looking at in your clinic. And you can rough estimate it with your own eyes. And our goal here is to be over 30%. So we don't need a ton of individual motility. If you look at this video, I'd estimate this to be in the 40% range with my naked eye. Um, you're just looking at the comparison of those moving across the screen to those in the background. And um, if, if you wanna step it up a notch and use more than just your naked eye, um, I feel like a salesperson for eye sperm. I promise you I'm not, but uh, I, this is one of my favorite tools that I can carry in my truck, um, an iPad with a computer program that screws into the camera in the back and you can evaluate sperm from any species on it. Uh, they do have specific programs for the different species, but I've, cheated the system and you can you know, evaluate horse semen on the GOAT program. The camera's the same. Uh, it might just not, it might not be exact, but it's close enough if you're doing an evaluation of semen quality. Um, you have to look at sperm, mor sperm morphology too if you're evaluating that uh, ram or buck and a little bit different than our our motility where we want a higher percentage here, we want about 70%. I didn't mention prior to motility, but scrotal circumference is something else we're evaluating. I use this number real loose in our small ruminants because we can have, you know, a fin sheep that or a Shetland sheep that only weighs 80 pounds at mature weight versus a Suffolk ram that weighs 400. And yet we have this universal number of 30 centimeters. There's no way your biggest, most masculine Shetland is ever going to meet that number. Um, so you have to use a little bit of your own um, judgment here. 
in talking to your clients. When you're looking at the morphology, I found this to be daunting when I got out of school and I just didn't want to learn it. It was easy to pass it off to somebody, you know, more senior than me that could do it well. And then he forced me to learn it. Um, it's not that hard. The majority of your sperm cells are going to be normal. Um, if you, uh, what I have seen, the majority of our defects are a folded mid-piece reflex tail or a coiled tail. And just recently, in the last couple of years, SFT changed their format and grading out these rams and bucks and bulls to normal versus head defects, mid-piece defects, and tail defects. We no longer say a distal mid-piece reflex versus a coiled tail versus a, you know, a head size. It's, it's very simply um, separated out into head, mid-piece, and tail now. So in evaluating a ram prior to breeding season. Um, these are what my reports look like. You could use, this is a bull form that SFT puts out that you could use. This is what we have made on our own here at the clinic. And you can see these are three rams we evaluated. And the, I can turn this over to the client on the scrotal circumference, their motility and their morphology. And then down here, I provide an interpretation because clients read these numbers, but they don't quite know what they mean. Um, so you can see that because of this last ram whiskey's morphology, he technically fails. Is he going to make females pregnant? Yes, but not to the extent that the, the two above him would. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you the next slide is a, is a different clinic putting out a, a report. So this is a report I received back actually on a ram that I sold. Um, and the, the people who purchased him did the right thing. They took him to a veterinarian um, in their local area and had him evaluated. And um, I just really enjoyed that the sample was very poor quality, very few cells, very few live sperm, no motility, and his testicles are small. Um, I encourage you guys, if you're going to evaluate a ram or a buck, please try to put some numbers on there. At least a scrotal circumference, you can get a tape. Um, so we have something to work with and the very slim chance of being a good breeder. I'm going to repeat this breeding status exam this weekend and we'll see where he's at. I'm actually very suspicious that this person collected pre-ejaculate as opposed to ejaculate. <clears throat> if not, this is a bad ram and, and we should not be turning out with a, with a use. So what else can we do for teaching our clients about managing and getting these females pregnant as uh, efficiently as possible, uh, we have to take into account the environment we're in. So are we out in the desert, it's super hot and their testicles are probably way overheated and the sperm is dead? Are we somewhere where the sun never comes up and this is as bright as it gets? Um, are we in a perfectly normal environment and he should be fertile? We have to take that into effect and manage the breeding appropriately. Um, some well-known data shows that because they are uh, short day breeders are small ruminants um, they're going to breed best in the fall and winter and then as we come into spring you can see here on the graph they start to exhibit no signs of estrus because they've gone into a period of anestrus and we need to wait until late summer for them to the days to start to shorten for them to come back into regular cyclicity um, Clients really struggle to understand this. They really want to capitalize on this time of year because it's the time of year that they're maybe a little slower, they're home more, they have time to get the ram to you or the buck to you and get them collected or the female bred and or, or um, where I see it is them wanting to flush females that didn't conceive during the normal season. They want to do it now and it's just not ideal. There's also seasonality on top of by time of year, we have to worry about it by breed. Um, some breeds have a longer anestrus period versus a summer shorter. Um, so working with your clients to understand that and just educating them to maximize their efficiency is really important. So when I tell clients, talk to clients and they say, what should I do? Um, I just did this about an hour ago. Um, October, November for most of our breeds is the ideal time anywhere in the United States to get this done. Uh, maybe December as we're going a little more south. 
Other things we can do to increase efficiency, increase uh, their feed. So the term people are gonna use is flushing. It can be confusing because we can talk about flushing embryos, but for in this um, context, we're talking about adding, um, increasing their nutritional energy level in the time leading up to breeding in order to increase ovulation. So this study here shows that as you increase their allowance to pasture and the quality of pasture, we are increasing their ovulation rate. So we can extrapolate from this in increasing their grain or energy um, ourselves, no matter what time of year, we can increase uh, their cyclicity and ovulation rate. The ram or buck effect, this um, I find to be extremely helpful. I use a vasectomized ram. Here he is, his name is Bob. Um, here he is here chasing ewes. Uh, if you put him out about, I put him out about three weeks prior so that we can get one cycle um, induced and them starting on their next cycle. Because that first cycle, a lot of times it's, I think of it like horses with a transition heat. Um, it, it could be short, it could be silent, it could be ineffective. So if you want to maximize your performance and you want them to say, so for me, it's April 9th is the day I'm targeting to have September 1 lambs this coming fall. Um, I'm gonna put him out here the beginning of March so that he's going to bring them all in once. And then that second heat that we are going to trigger um, on October, and April 9th is fertile. Um, but you could use fence line bucks. You could use vasectomized bucks. Um, you could use a buck rag. Um, there are options. Another simple way of getting that heat induced um, is prostaglandin injections, but this has to be in season. So this is not gonna work for these April breedings. We need to worry about the fact that they're out of season. Um, so if you're in season, say next August, or sorry, next October, you want to bring your females in, your client does, uh, you could talk to them about using prostaglandin to synchronize them or induce an, uh, estrus. Um, I prefer estrome over lutelice. It's subjectively, people say that it's superior in small ruminants. Um, we've discussed doing a study to prove this. We haven't established it yet, but it might be coming down the pipeline. Um, the bottom line is neither of these are 100% in our small ruminants. They're not 100% in our ruminants either, but they are less effective in our small compared to our large ruminants. So beware, especially when you're talking about aborting or terminating a accidental pregnancy. Dr. Gately? Yep. Yeah. What is the approval for food producing animals and smaller ruminants with those products? Oh, that's a good question. They are not labeled. Um, there is no meat or milk withdrawal in either of these drugs in bovids. Um, we've extrapolated that for small ruminants and being minor species, you can use them off label. Um, so I honestly don't worry much about it. Don't know if that is what I should say. Um, but you know, there, but there is nothing labeled for small ruminants. <clears throat> And there are other brands. Those are these are just the two that we carry and I'm familiar with. Um, some key things to remember with your prostaglandin use in our smaller ruminants. Again, it's only going to work during se while they're in season and cycling. Um, that CL needs to be at least five to seven days old for it to be effective. So similar to our cattle, so like maybe slightly younger. Um, so th for that reason. In the perfect world, you'd give two doses about 11 days apart. To That way, if you hit somebody at, say, day four on the first shot, you're going to pick them up on the second. And I tell clients to expect them to be in behavioral heat in 24 to 48 hours. And they sometimes struggle with understanding that, especially when we talk about inducing or aborting. Other options are progesterone, so our cedars, which are nicely labeled for small ruminants, but none of the other drugs in a cedar protocol are. Um, so our cedar is implanted with progesterone, um, and this is going to help bring somebody in out of season. So for my ewes that I want to lay them in September, they're going to go out with the teaser buck here in another week or two, or not even two, a week, and then um, they're going to go through a cedar protocol in order to bring them into heat out of season. 
just real quick, uh, what um, Zoetis puts out there for how to put the cedar in. I, the reason I'm showing you, you guys probably all know how to put a cedar in, but um, this is a nice image to give your clients who need to put them in on their own, unless you have those clients who are gonna pay you to come out and insert these. And I certainly have those myself. I call that the, the easy money, the bread and butter of practice. Um, whereas other people might laugh, um, I'll easily do this if they wanna pay the vet to do it. Um, but you're gonna use the, I'm gonna show you my protocol, a typical kind of gen generic protocol that I use on the next page that utilizes PG600 which again is not labeled for small ruminants. Um, so this is a typical generic protocol for laparoscopic AI, but you could just replace for a natural breeding. When you put the teaser ram in with the use, just put the real ram in or the real buck in if that's how you're breeding, if you're pasture breeding, um, this protocol will work. One of the big things I see in practice and for some reasons these seem to funnel down to me at TVFS from Southern New England are females, mostly goats um, that are cycling irregularly. Um, the complaints I'm hearing are my doe won't come into heat or my doe won't settle or my doe is constantly coming into heat. So just like our cattle, the things I'm thinking about depending on the complaint are either a follicular cyst or a luteal cyst. And unfortunately we can't palpate them and diagnose these like we can cattle easily. So we kind of blindly treat them with either GnRH or prostaglandin. Um, I have the doses here just in case you want them. Um, there is there's some success in transrectally ultrasounding these. Some people are becoming very good at it. I've played with it a little bit. I find it frustrating. It's not a, a slam dunk like a cow that you're going to find the answer if you put that ultrasound in, but um, something to think about. <clears throat> All right, vasectomized rams or bucks, teaser rams or bucks. Um, I wanted to talk about this because I think this is something that is really up and coming. More and more people are maintaining these. And I know that they're asking if somebody comes to me for a laparoscopic or AI or embryo collection, you know, they typically are referring in and have a veterinarian that they routinely work with. And um, are asking that veterinarian to create their vasectomized buck or ram. So I wanted to just walk through it quickly because um, this is something you guys could add to your practice. It's pretty simple. Um, he is just a great management tool for detecting females in heat or bringing them into heat. Uh, he is going to act, he's going, behaviorally he will be a ram or a buck. Clients think that this is going to alter his behavior. It's not. Um, obviously he still has the testosterone, but it's just going to deem him infertile. Um, this is the words written out. If you guys are gonna have a copy of these slides you can read, refer back to, but I'm gonna walk through them with pictures. I typically just use a light sedation and set them on their rump. Some people might, when you're starting out, want to use general anesthesia if you can, so you don't have to feel rushed or have any response. Um, I set them on their rump like this, or a lot of times people will tack them onto a lap AI or embryo collection appointment. So I might lay them in my AI cradle. But if I don't have the cradle, I'll set them on the rump. It's a good job for the owner to hold them in place. Um, and this is one of our other veterinarians doing one. Um, we just drape in his um, entire scrotum, and then we're gonna cut along the dorsal surface of his spermatic cord. Um, these are some pictures that I've taken from the internet that do a better job explaining it than the ones I've produced thus far. Um, but it's very easy once you get to that skin to elevate up the spermatic cord. And um, you can see a vas deferens and an artery, and there's a vein. Um, the key is to get the vas deferens, not the artery. The vas deferens is firmer, um, almost gristly. So it, it, you can strum it with your finger and know which one to separate out. Um, so then you nick the tunic and dissect out the uh, vas deferens. And you wanna take about two to three centimeters of it. So you can see the ligatures here. I do that too. Um, and the reason I do that is I wanna keep the semen inside the vas deferens so I can confirm that I have the vas deferens. So I ligate and then remove that middle piece. 
uh, it's going to look like this. And then a just quick couple continuous sutures or one big cruciate is honestly what I usually do. Through the skin, don't worry about the prolapsed spermatic cord through the tunic and close them up. And I teach all our interns to do this. And this is a typical, very excited, I found the vast deference and got it out face behind a mask. And the last part of that is confirming it's the vast deference because it's really nerve wracking to tell a client to go home and turn them out with use in 14 or I, I prefer 30 days and know that he's not fertile. Um, so what I do is take it back to the lab um, and flush out just some saline or semen extender through um, the vast deference catheterizing is very difficult. Some people are much better at it than others. And you get that drop on your slide um, and you look at it. Uh, if you don't get semen because you're doing a young rammer buck, you could send out for histology um, or you could repeat collection um, later on to make sure he's fertile. Um, I tell people ideally 30 days, um, 14 days is in theory how long it lives in the tract, but I would not want to push that number. So I go with 30. So this is exactly, this is an actual video from this vast deference right here. Um, this is what you're going to find and you feel very confident that you took the correct piece out of the spermatic cord. I do it on both of them and then I send them home. Are there any questions on vasectomies? <coughs> All right. Um, then we're gonna, other things we can do uh, on maximizing getting those females pregnant is diagnosing that pregnancy and maybe characterizing it. Characterizing it is important to me for maintaining the pregnancy, which is coming up. Um, so as far as simply diagnosing it, your non-pregnant females, um, you can if you do this early enough, you can have an option to rebreed them and, and determine what that is, or you could call them so you're not carrying them through the season. Your pregnant females, you can go further and predict, predict the numbers um, and ascertain that you're going to feed them appropriately. And I think that's really important to preventing preg pox, which we're going to talk about. And that's the major concern in these animals. Um, transrectal versus transabdominal ultrasound, both are options. I use both. I use majority transabdominal. Transrectal is kind of in my back pocket for a female that might be earlier or have something funny going on that I can look in. And typically I just slide my um, curved linear or linear probe in the rectum blindly. And as long as you kind of keep a little bit of downward pressure on it, you can see the uterus just fine. Um, and an empty one is gonna be really easy to see on this view. And it looks just like a bovine uterus that's not pregnant. Uh, Transabdominal, you have to wait a hair longer, um, but it's kinder to the animal. There's less reactivity. Um, and you wanna go in that right inguinal area, just kind of right in front of the udder. And then I angle it towards the opposite tip. So I like this image, my, that yellow arrow is where my probe is going to go in the direction. Um, and this image is pretty typical. You have your bladder and just in front of it are all cross sections of fluid of uterus, which is my first clue that she might be pregnant. Some research that we did a few years ago, um, just for some data points for you guys, if you are scanning early as to when you might detect things. So, in the mid 20s is when you're gonna see a fluid filled uterus. In um, the late 20s, it's, and I've pushed this earlier since, you can identify a fetus with a heartbeat in there. And then some things I keep in mind are that, I call it a mature placentome, but a placentome that is donut-like, um, has that center to it, is about day 40. So if you see those, that female's at least 40 days pregnant. And then the ribs start to show up there shortly after. So here's your fluid filled uterus in the mid twenties. And then when you can get over a fetus, you can see, you almost can see the body versus the head. And you can see the flicker if this was a video of the heartbeat. Placentomes in the early thirties start to bubble out like mushrooms. And then jumping ahead, the placentome becomes mature like this donut shape. 
in the early 40s. So in the course of 10 days, we go from that little bump on the side of the uterus to this very mature placentome. Um, other things as we proceed quickly through the, or very quickly they develop in the, day, in the 30 day range. Um, you have legs starting to evaginate. You could start to sex them in the late 30s and there's your ribs starting to come in and then the umbilicus becomes very obvious. I find that this is also the most ideal time to count. So if people want to count, um, earlier ultrasound is better than later. Um, things you know, we've noticed is that um, the best time to find twins is the mid 20s to the mid 40s. Um, triplets, you really need to be on the early side of that because after the mid 30s, you start to lose that third one being easily detectable. In this image, you can see there's two fetuses lying in one image. Um, obviously, this is a, the most concrete way of diagnosing twins, but knowing your land, your orientation and where you are moving through the uterus, it's usually pretty easy to feel comfortable counting. And as you move on from a singleton pregnancy, you can diagnose that fairly easily. But as you move out from twins and then to triplets, uh, it becomes harder. So what I like to tell people is there's at least one, there's at least two, or there's at least three, because they're going to be, your, you know, clients, they're going to come firing back at you. If you said she had three, but she had four. Um, it's easy to miss that last one as the numbers go up. All right, so now that we've achieved a pregnant female, how do we maintain her pregnancy? I think nutrition is the most important thing to talk about here. And by no means am I a nutritionist. Um, I raise my own flock so I can kind of put to work what I preach. Um, and I find that providing them good quality feed, especially in that last one to two months of their pregnancy, um, is most important because that's when the fetus is developing the most. Um, this is actually a picture from my barn. And you can see I have two different breeds. I have tall, hard doing dorsets and short, very efficient texels. Um, and feeding them together is very tricky. Um, things I do, the dorsets come into the barn and go on the, the nice lush alfalfa and grain about two months before they're due or six weeks. The texels come in about a week before they're due um, because they, if these guys ate this, this feed for two months, they would be having 20 pound monsters and need C-sections every time. Um, so having clients and producers that learn that I think is really important. Um, on the flip side though, I see a fair amount of clients that just don't feed them well enough. And that's where we're getting the preg talks. One other thing is plenty of bunk space. I find people really pack them into a barn. So I like to make sure there's room for these girls to spread out and not push on each other. And the reason for that is pregnancy toxemia. I don't know what you guys are seeing up there in Maine, but I think we've had one of the worst years yet for our, the number of cases of pregnancy toxemia we've seen, which is fairly contrast, a big contrast to last year where we saw practically none. I don't know what the difference is. I have a few suspicions. Um, but our clients need to understand if they, you know, if we did that early ultrasound and know that they have twins or triplets, can we feed them more aggressively for those females to avoid pregnancy toxemia? And again, that's going to have to be in the last four to six weeks when we need to start on it. One client's having almost every female have pregnancy toxemia and they did increase their feed, but they did it about one week before the first year was due and maybe three weeks before the majority of them were due and it was just too late. Just a quick review, I'm not a physiologist and don't want to even try to be one, but ketosis, basically they're in a negative energy balance. So they start to break down their fat and muscle. The fat and muscle is gonna go, um, those byproducts are gonna go clog up our liver and they're basically gonna have um, toxicity from you know the ketones building up. <clears throat> I tell my clients about ketosis and that there's three different types. There's primary, so a female that's undernourished, she's starving. She just can't consume enough to maintain herself and her pregnancy. There's secondary ketosis, so she has something else going on. She has pneumonia or mastitis, so she's not eating and therefore 
she's developing ketosis or state ketosis, which I do see a fair amount, especially in the show animals and that we see like very concentrated in New England. Um, they're obese going into late pregnancy um, and the massive internal fat deposits that they have are taking up more abdominal space along with their room and along with their uterus. Um, and they have a decreased appetite and it just all kind of snowballs together and creates ketosis. So how are our small ruminants at risk? Um, the closer they are to the due date, the more at risk they are. Um, the more sets of lambs or kids they've had, the more at risk they are. Um, the bigger the litter size, so our triplets, our quads, and almost, I've seen a few cases with quintuplets and they almost always have it. Um, their body condition, so if they're a body condition score of a one or five, they're more prone. The energy in their diet, are we feeding them appropriately? The quality of their roughage is probably one of the biggest contributors in my mind. Um, stress. And lastly, there's a genetic component. But the four that I focus on because we can do something about them um, is litter size, body condition. Um, energy and roughage quality kind of go together. Um, if we know we have a big litter, we can manage them differently. Um, we can try to control their body condition ahead of time. And regardless of either of those two, we can control that energy level in the diet and the quality of the roughage. I really enjoy this picture with clients. You have to use it in PowerPoint though, because it's animated. So we have our room in here, obviously. And then as the uterus grows with time, it pushes and prevents that room from fully being the size it wants to be to maintain her. So if we only have this tiny little bit of space to maintain her or to fill up her room in, fill, um, it has to be really high quality stuff to put in there to take care of those three kids as well as herself. So what are our signs of preg tox? I'm sure you guys have all seen it. Um, but I think what most clients miss is the early signs. So I like to educate them for the first sign. And the first sign to me is the slightest decrease in aggression to eat. Um, they might saunter into the feed trough as opposed to run and bully their way in. Later, um, they start to aimlessly wander around while everybody else is eating. I like to make fun of myself. So here's my own barn. This you here has preg tox. Everybody else is aggressively eating and she's just making her situation worse over here kind of rocking on her back feet, doing anything but going and putting energy into her body. Other things she'll do, grind her teeth, um, and you'll see them will lose body condition very quickly. Later on, they'll become incoordinated. Um, they'll not want to stand up at all, and sometimes people don't find them until they're dead or near death. Um, that genetic component I mentioned is real. This you here, and this you here, this is her daughter. She was inside of her at this time. She is not dead. We actually saved her, but it was through a massive heroic. So what can we do as the veterinarian when we're called in um, or have our clients do? Um, keto sticks are what most people have. Uh, to me, they're a thing of the past, but I understand that not everybody has a BHBA meter. Um, the Nova Vet meter, I think is about $45. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, the precision meter works really well too. I think every large animal veterinarian should have one of these and every small ruminant, pregnant small ruminant that is ill should have one of these done on them as part of their physical exam. Um, there's plenty of other places I use it too and the glucose strips work on it just fine if you're dealing with something that's hypoglycemic. <coughs> For another reason. Um, the cutoff we've established, we actually did this work here at Tufts, um, is 0.8 and we validated this meter right here. So it's slightly lower than our cattle. The other way it's different than our cattle is that um, we just have a stark cutoff of 0.8. Um, we cannot use the level of um, elevation to correlate to how ill they are. So an animal with a 4.6 BHBA is not necessarily uh, more at risk than one that's 1.2. 
Um, they, you have to, once you get over that 0.8, you just have to evaluate them on their clinical uh, presentation. Things that I think help us go to the next level of care, the biggest one would be a chemistry. We have an in-house simple chemistry machine that just gives us a few things. Uh, calcium and potassium are on there, magnesium, uh, and phosphorus. Uh, so we run one of those. They don't cost our clients that much. You could also send out blood. And most times they're low in calcium, low in phosphorus, low in magnesium, all of those to some degree, um, which means that they benefit from fluids pretty quickly. The other diagnostic to not forget is a fecal because of peripartarian rise in homonchus. So um, these use, when they're sick, the homonchus say, hey, it's time to take over and take advantage. Um, so we wanna make sure if that's there that we take care of them so that we're not having a confounding factor. Once we've diagnosed a small remnant with ketosis, the most obvious answer is oral propylene glycol. Most clients know this. I find that most clients wanna use something like keto gel or CMPK fluid, all sorts of different things. I know they don't like the taste of propylene glycol, but it is the best. And usually we do two ounces twice a day. And then if they're still eating, if we catch them really early, the best thing we can do for them is to bump up that grain and alfalfa, the energy dense, protein dense feed, calcium dense feed uh, for them. Where I think we all can improve as a, the attending veterinarian, if the owner can afford it, because this does cost money, obviously, is adding in the additional treatments. Uh, we have a handful of patients on these additional treatments right now. And that's IV catheter placement with a fluid regimen that I have kind of a base standard of, if you take your average 100 to 150 pound female, um, she's gonna get one liter of LRS twice a day IV with uh, usually with a 5% dextrose and 25 mils of calcium added to that bag. I adjust that accordingly with uh, chemistries if the client's willing to run them. Um, and if they're bigger, obviously the fluids go to more and more frequently and smaller, we decrease. Additional treatment options, um, the banamine to help make them feel better. They're rocking on their feet. They're building up edema. Um, thiamine to keep that rumen healthy. And then pantoprazole is something we're using more and more and more um, to protect their abomasums because we're seeing a lot of abomasal ulcers in these females. And then insulin is something that if you have an animal that's hospitalized or that you're seeing routinely and can monitor glucose levels, you could add in insulin. I think that is like the highest level you can go um, and something I rarely, rarely do. But if you want to save the animal, and her offspring at all costs. And it's looking bleak, it's something I would definitely add in. And then if we're beyond any hope for all of that, either inducing, doing a C-section or euthanizing, depending on her status. Um, I had a client that called down over the weekend, she's 35 days from her due date and down from ketosis. I discussed with him, she has no chance of getting to her due date in my mind. Um, so he induced to abort, trying to save her. Um, you have to have that discussion of who is more important. I feature this picture in a lot of talks I do. This is from when I was an intern and the client wanted to save both, would not allow us to induce or do a C-section, wanted to get her to her due date a few days from now. Um, and then finally said she was getting worse, called and said, let's do a C-section. So we went out to do a C-section and she dropped that in front of us. We necropsied her and obviously her fetuses had died a long time before we got to her because um, that is one kid blown up in emphysematous and there's one in the other horn. Um, so intervention earlier than later, I think is really important. Um, but this is what treatment of them looks like. This is that you that I featured in the video in my own barn. Um, she responded great to her treatment. I'm gonna show you a video on the next slide of what is typical. This you hauled into our clinic with ketosis. We used the hatchback of the SUV of the owner and treated her. And the typical response when they get on these fluids, 
see if this works. Oh no. What did I do? Okay. It's a little blurry and stretched out, but usually midway through their first bag of fluids, they start to eat aggressively. My suspicion is this is the correction of the calcium and the potassium. Um, you see I have nice green alfalfa in front of her. They typically start to eat as you run that first bag of fluids. <coughs> and if all goes well, you get them to term. And this is Annie with her triplets um, successfully. She lived on, as you can see, she had, we made her a five liter bag. She got two and a half twice a day because you guys know our schedule. That is when I could get to her. Um, and she was on insulin and we got her 25 days to deliver these guys. This does cost a lot of money. Um, so that is a, client, a conversation to have with your clients. Um, our outcomes, you have an increased chance of dystocia because as you can see in this picture, the female is too weak to deliver, stand up and clean off these lambs. So usually they need to be assisted. Your lambs and kids are usually slower, slower to eat um, and just not as healthy. So you have to be on the lookout uh, for things like pneumonia, um, decreased weight gain as they grow in those first few weeks. But I go back to prevention and if we can identify how many fetuses are in that uterus early on, we can feed them differently, especially at the end of their pregnancy and hopefully prevent preg talks. Any questions on preg talks? What kind of insulin are you using? Regular? Uh, oof, it's the, is it Prozin? It's the one we use in cats oh, and I am not okay. a small animal vet. The green bottle box. I think it's Prozin. Yeah. What's that? Prozinc. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Prozinc. And I think, I forget if I had the dose on there. If not, reach out to me and I can give it to you. What I did with that you is I, I dosed it and then I just did a glucose curve afterwards to make sure she did fine. And I also give it at the same time as the fluids. What do you think? Oh, go ahead. Uh, what do you think about like the overconditioned uh, show does that are just fatties and in late pregnancy and like you are just ketosis and I find that they um, have more just even if I maybe they have subclinical ketosis or something else going on but they tend to have like more issues kidding um, in terms of like upping that nutrient like giving them grain in the late pregnancy versus like I'm giving them grain, are they just getting fatter? Yeah, so my philosophy has actually changed in the last two years on this specific topic. Um, I'm my own worst enemy in that I show myself um, and I go down to Louisville in November with pregnant females, uh, yet I'm a veterinarian and I know that what we show, the show ring demands obesity and as a veterinarian, that's like the worst thing I could prescribe. So I used to bring them out of Louisville and try to cut them back and get them into good body condition. And undoubtedly, they would always become sick, hence Annie. I, that was right after she won Louisville. Um, I changed two years ago, and when they come out of Louisville, they I continue to push them like I've been pushing them for show. Um, and I've, very, I've practically eliminated the ketosis in them. So my new philosophy is if they're obese show animals, you need to push them hard and keep the coals poured to them until they lamb in or, or kid in. Um, I, Cause if you cut them back, you're just like inevitably inducing ketosis. So I find you get less ketosis if you continue to pour the coals to them, so to say. Is that what you're looking for? Yep, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to mention hypocalcemia quickly because it is something we see and the first time I saw it, it wasn't even on my radar until I was about to euthanize the ewe. And I said, you know what? This really looks like a cow with milk fever. Let me just try this in the field because she's gonna die anyway. And I ran her some calcium IV and she stood up and walked around. Um, so the thing to remember in our sheep is that this is in late pregnancy as opposed to, it. I've, I haven't really seen it post, um, 
post lambing. It's only uh, pre lambing in the ewes from what I've seen. I'm sure there's a case where it does happen postpartum. Whereas our goats, it's usually postpartum, just like our cattle. Um, and it usually accompanies subclinical hypocalcemia to mildly clinical accompanies ketosis. But some really bad down, I'm going to die hypocalcemia cases in ewes late pregnancy is a very rare, real thing. So keep it on your radar. Um, and the treatment, I just think of a sheep as one tenth or one, let's see, or a fifth of a, of a cow and I treat accordingly. Um, so IV calcium, just be really slow with it, even slower than our cattle. <clears throat> Sub Q is very safe and something our clients can do over the phone. And then oral calcium, there's the Capricow boluses out there that I was really excited about when they came out a couple years ago and I have found them not to be helpful at all. One of these days I'm going to break up a bova calc bolus and try that, but I haven't gotten there yet. Right now I just tell my clients to go to tractor supply and get the powdered line and put that out free choice and that tends to help um, prevent it if they don't already have a, a real good free choice mineral in their barn. <clears throat> um, I threw in abortive diseases because uh, I feel like this talk isn't complete without them. I'm going to kind of skim over real quick the, the, the top few because I think we all can go read all we want about them if we don't already know about them. Um, but I wanted to touch on Cache Valley with the uptick we saw last year. Um, so I felt like I should mention the others as well. Campylobacter Vibrio um, causing late term abortions, um, big things. Um, it causes our fetuses to look autolyzed with fluid in their peritoneal cavity and thoracic cavity. A lot of people, clients refer to them as um, water belly lambs. Um, and if you're lucky and you necropsy one of the fetuses, you might see these spots on the liver. It's very pathognomonic for Campylobacter. Um, but I don't know that many of us actually open up these fetuses. Um, what I've people who want to do any testing. I mean, this is something we can do ourselves if we're already out there, but if they're going to do testing, um, I, I do open up the fetus. I look quickly. I take the fetal abomasum, liver and lungs, and then some of the placenta and send that off, just tie off that abomasum and send that off for necropsy, or you could just send the whole lamb with a piece of placenta, um, for, uh, histopath, sorry, and, and lab workup. Uh, but Campylobacter and Chlamydia is the next one we're going to talk about. Uh, their treatments are similar with tetracycline. So the second I suspect an infectious abortion going on in a, in a small ruminant barn, I'm going to inject everybody with oxytet and start them on oromycin, which requires a VFD, but that's pretty easy to do. And the standard dosing is one ounce per head per day. And once we have a known abort, infectious abortion, abortion that we think is Campylobacter or Chlamydia. Um, typically those flocks for me or herds are staying on oromycin every year, 30 days prior to the first female due. Um, so this happens in my own barn. I've raised sheep for almost 30 years now. And this happened actually the year I applied to vet school. Um, and since then I just do this every winter. It's probably overkill, but I don't want to take a chance. And the reason is for the Chlamydia that we're gonna talk about next. But this one's zoonotic. Um, also during interviewing for vet school, um, I found out this is zoonotic and I got very sick. <clears throat> Chlamydia though, um, similar, except the, the fetuses aren't uh, aut autolytic like uh, the Campylobacter ones. And um, this one can linger. And this is why I think we keep a lot of times we don't have the actual answer of knowing is it Campylobacter, is it Toxo, is it Chlamydia? So we just leave them on that oromycin in the years to come because if it is Chlamydia, um, they typically only get sick once, but they become persistently infected and they share it with their the, the coming yearling ewes that the ram breeds and spreads it around. Um, so we worry about it. Um, both Chlamydia and Campylobacter have a vaccine that can be used if you are worried about them. I find more people use the Campylobacter vaccine than the Chlamydia one. 
Um, but all in all, I don't have many clients using it. Um, it's a little bit funny of um, both of them have a slightly different protocol um, around breeding. Some clients, though, I know do use it. Q fever. Um, I have this one on here because I witnessed this in my own barn. Um, they can, a lot of times our small ruminant flocks or herds could pick this up from an animal in the wild. So you might not have it. You might do all this testing, prove you don't have it. And then all of a sudden you have it. Um, but it too is going to cause late term abortions um, and, and poor reproductive performance. Um, I haven't seen much of it where I've seen it actually is when humans get sick and they have a history of being in a, a small ruminant barn that's lambing or kidding. <coughs> My sister got this about eight years ago and we had a you have lambs a couple days earlier that she helped with and the lambs actually died the next day. They were perfectly normal when they were born. And then two days later, the you died. Uh, we never were able to exhume the you and, and find out, but we presume that's where she got it from. Um, so, um, know that it's out there and we should test for it. And another reason to keep pregnant women out of the barn or anybody that's immune compromised. Toxo tends to be the one I actually see the most of. And that's because our cats are defecating in, um, the most common thing we talk about is in the hay source. So every time I see my cat in the hay barn, I worry. But uh, recently, the what we've found to be the causative issue is cats using mineral because we are really preaching free choice mineral to our small ruminants and they're using the mineral containers or mineral feeders as litter boxes in the winter um, so something to think about um, the classic appearance is that the um, cotyledons on the aborted placenta look like this they look like pepperonis we have all these classic pathognomonic things we talk about, but I honestly find that they're very hard to diagnose. Cache Valley is probably the easiest one to diagnose. Um, if I were standing in front of you, all you guys, I'd ask you to raise your hand and say who saw this, especially last year. Um, I know down here in southern New England, we had a ton of it. And the biggest is these congenital abnormalities, these arthrogar post legs. Um, a lot of them had big skulls. Um, hydroencephaly and um, a lot of people had poor reproductive performance here on my own farm so if you if the sheep or goat is bit by an effect an infected mosquito early on less than 32 days of pregnancy she's going to go through early embryonic death and rebreed probably what looks like two cycles later from the original breeding so what m this meant in like my own flock and a lot of other ones that i know and goats there's this happened equally um if you say you put your ram out September 1 and you took them out mid-October, well, they were pregnant maybe the end of September and then the ram was out or the buck was out. And by the time they came back in, it was too late. So what ended up, most of us ended up having was a bunch of females that went open last year um, and then led to the obesity that we just kind of talked about um, because they basically had the year off. And if you kept them, they probably got obese. Um, if they're bitten slightly later in gestation, they can have musculoskeletal or CNS signs in the offspring. Um, I did a talk on this last year on Zoom and now I get calls from around the country year round because everybody thinks arthrogryposis in a newborn lamb or kid equals Cache Valley. And people want to figure out testing and a lot of veterinarians, RDVMs are telling the, that person that they can't the sample. I'm here to tell you guys it's really easy. We collected them on all of the samples that we found last year on all the, the fetuses and it's super easy. You need either fetal heart blood or thoracic fluid, which was intimidating when I heard that. But literally, if you take a scalpel and slice down their sternum and crack their chest open, there is fluid sitting in their chest. Just suck it up with a 3cc syringe, put it in a red top and send it to Cornell and test for it. Um, if a client wants to confirm that that's what it is. You can do serum testing, but all that does is say she was exposed at one point. Where that might be nice is to prove that she probably won't ever get it again. 
Um, I have not heard of any cases this year. So I think last year was the product of the drought the year before and the wetness that we had last year. These are some classic lambs that I saw. This is one of my own. Interesting part is I, this ewe didn't look pregnant in the days leading up to her due date, but I had her very specifically ultrasounded for her due date. So about three days before her due date, when she had no other development, I said, I'm gonna scan her and see if she lost her lamb. And I scanned and I saw this lamb on ultrasound and I said, that lamb is gonna have, gonna come out as a cash valley lamb because it was all contorted on ultrasound and sure enough it did. Um, but yeah, they use tend and does tend to not bag up like a normal ewe. Um, they, or doe, they, they lamb and kid in very empty. Um, and a lot of times when you crack the skulls, we did them on all these, I would say 80 to 90% had no brain matter inside their skull. So it's a rather horrific disease. <clears throat> this is a ewe that um, had quadruplets. Two looked like this. One was incredibly tiny, like four pounds, and then one was normal. Um, when we talk about the abortive diseases in general, um, I pulled this, it's been a couple of years, I use this with students to show, um, if you were to do the entire Cornell abortive panel, this is what it cost us as veterinarians. So it's a pricey thing to not get a lot of good results back. <clears throat> All right. So now we've gotten to the point of parturition. What are some things that are a little oddball that I've seen? Obviously, you guys have all dealt with dystocias, whether, I don't know, every species. Um, but beyond our routine, you know, breech birth or head back, what else do we see? Um, uterine torsions have been something that I never thought about before becoming a veterinarian that I've now probably seen half a dozen of in my career. And they're really, really hard to diagnose prior, um, or they're just, they're hard to diagnose. Um, this one, obviously in the picture on the right, I diagnosed post-mortem. Um, she had been tours for days. The U on the left had, you know, that's, this is how they present to us. They're not progressing it, it, or they're not even this far along. There's nothing coming out of them, but you feel like they should have been lambing and they're maybe slightly off. Um, so I've done things like, you know, a really big U, you can try to rectally palpate and feel it. I did it once. I've tried putting in the ultrasound rectally blindly to diagnose them. They're just hard. I find you have to act on a hunch and the treatment is a C-section. <clears throat> the other one that presents extremely similarly, which is why I have the same picture down here, is a ring womb. So this U was actually a ring womb and I find with the ring womb that the fetal membranes start to come out, whereas with the torsion, they don't, because how is fetal membranes going to get through here? Um, and I love this pic cartoon because it's exactly what you're experiencing. I've probably done three C-sections this year so far on ring wounds. Um, I've only ever done them in sheep, but they can happen in does, um, so the literature says. Um, and the classic sign is that they're in labor with no progress. And those cervixes, they, you know, you guys know what they feel like if you're in there and you manipulate them and they start to dilate. These just have zero dilation. <coughs> There's no known cause for these and it's very frustrating to try to prevent them. And the only thing you can do is a C-section. The nice thing is they're usually at term and uh, the lamb or kid is usually alive. So if we decide to go the route of a C-section, it usually has a happy ending, um, as long as we intervene early enough. And that is part of this talk is commit to it and intervene for that C-section early enough. This is another point where I'd ask to raise your hand if uh, I was there about how many of you guys are doing C-sections. I know from what I see down here, there's clinics that will do them and clinics that won't. Um, and if they won't, they send them to us. Um, so I figured I'd review a C-section. Uh, we do a fair amount of them. And I think that's because not only do we have our own clients, we have referrals from multiple clinics around us. Um, different people have different approaches, whether you wanna do a paralumbar approach or paramedian or midline. And do you wanna do them under gas, under injectable, under local? Um, I will tell you my preference is to do them standing with only a local, if at all possible. Obviously this one here I'm doing under general um, and she's 
down on our size. Again, the words are for you guys to come back and look at um, the two different approaches. I do a lot of them this way because they have come in, they are morbidly obese, ketotic. They can't stand, um, they're too far gone, if you will, to try medical treatment of this ketosis. So the option is let's do a C-section and get the lamb or kid out. Hopefully they'll survive. A lot of times people don't know the due dates. Um, but if not, they're willing to sacrifice a kid or lambs for the female's sake. Um, so even this situation, I would, and I did do this you with no sedation. She has a catheter in, so we can hit her at any point. Um, and a lot of times I'll try to get them with just a local block to the point of removing the lambs or kids and then sedating her if she starts to feel better and wants to stand up. But oftentimes, um, this is just doing them in the field and prepping them. Um, these are, this one's from last year and this one's from this year. Um, this is that you that was prepped two slides ago. Uh, we have somebody sitting on the head or not on the head, I shouldn't say that, at the head, ready to restrain that animal if needed. And then a veterinarian doing, or two doing the procedure. So here, one of our office staff is holding the doe's head. Um, while we're getting the surgery done. We look like quite the messy surgeons, but we had triplets we were trying to resuscitate and save. Um, I think this was eight o'clock at night and we all just wanted to go home. Um, the the um, anesthesia machine is out for us to have oxygen for the newborns. You can see this lamb right here has a mask on um, to save them. Um, when we close our uteruses, an inverting pattern, we like the Utrecht. And honestly, if I get a first closure that looks like this, nice and clean and no membrane sticking out, no tears, I only do a single layer closure. That's something I've learned post-school. Um, but I know in school we teach two layers. <clears throat> Whereas this one, I would do a second layer because there's a few um, kind of stretch marks and, and tears and that serosa. This is my, this is me at two o'clock in the morning in my own barn. Um, but this is my ideal situation. A female that will stand, stand on a um, stand and be restrained nicely and do it this way. And on into, oftentimes I don't even put a drape on until I'm closing. Um, so I kind of just get in the way. Um, this was a ring womb. And the reason I like that when no sedation is Moments after the C-section, this is what I did about a month ago, they instantly walk over to the feeder and start eating and they never skip a beat. If they do skip a beat, one of the things we see, um, the biggest would be incisional uh, um, infections. And one time I, this is obviously a calf, um, but I cut into the fetus's leg cutting. So now when I, Inside the uterus, I make my stab incision, then I extend it with scissors. But um, oftentimes they they just they move on without a any issue. Um, I typically put mine on new floor, long term acting, a long acting broad spectrum antibiotic, oxytet, new floor. Um, if I have any concerns that it was really dirty, uh, ampicillin has become my go to antibiotic for. Um, a trusting drug that is going to handle whatever you throw at it. The last piece of this talk that I wanted to throw in here, although it doesn't quite fit with the title, but it, it is the follow up and then we'll be done, is um, so what can happen right after birth because if we get them on the ground and then we lose them, again, this has been for nothing. So the biggest disease I see is hypothermia. We see so many cases of this and it doesn't even have to be that cold. I've seen this happen on a 30 degree day or 40 degree day on a newborn that just doesn't eat fast enough. Um, so neonatal hypothermia is something I think we as vets can turn around very quickly. So um, hypothermia in them is defined as less than 101. Uh, 98 to 101 is mild hypothermia and then less than 98 is severe and we really need to, I, I tell clients it's fatal hypothermia if we don't intervene quickly. So in our mild cases, they're usually just weak and quiet. You take their temperature and it's, say it's 98.5. Um, 
we can usually have the client intervene if we talk to them over the phone and however they can warm them up. Um, a lot of people will use a hair dryer, I find to be the most common, and then tube feed them or bottle feed them if they would take it. Um, the problem is the severe hypothermia cases, and that's when they're under 98 and the client calls you because they're comatose. They look like this lamb right here. Um, and they want to tube feed them, but tube feeding them is only going to cause them to aspirate and it's not going to warm them up because they can't utilize that feed. Um, so we have to do something. Um, so I, if I go out, I'm going to do IV. I usually use a butterfly in the jugular and I'm going to use IV 5% dextrose and serial monitor their glucose levels uh, and, and their temperature until we get over 98 and then tube feed them. And you've turned them around and you don't look back. Um, if you can't hit a vein or you can't get there right away, you can instruct the client to mix up a 20% dextrose solution and give it intraperitoneally. I use a 20 gauge, one inch needle, one inch lateral to the umbilicus and one inch caudal. So right about there, insert it at a 45 degree angle. And then I attach my syringe at five mils per pound, inject that dextrose solution and put them under the heat lamp with you know the blow dryer on them. And usually within 15 to 30 minutes, you have come to, come up quite a bit in that body temperature and um, are on your way to saving them. The only other disease that I think, well, besides sepsis that mimics this is floppy kid syndrome or watery mouth and lamb, but I just call it floppy kid syndrome. And that's basically that they're acidotic. Um, I've had one case this year so far. And basically in my mind, if they're not septic, and their glucose is within normal range, but they're comatose, I'm thinking that this is it. And I treat them with IV bicarb at the same rate we do cattle. And <clears throat> they turn around very quickly. Um, the, the, treatment, um, the cause is fairly unknown. I do think that excessive milk or rapid milk does have something to do with it because um, the cases I see the most of are clients who are bottle feeding a lamb or a kid and they're overfeeding it. They're like, oh, he would only eat two ounces. So I tubed him six more. I mean, I'm a big believer in feeding them what they'll eat. Um, you obviously have to be aware, uh, you know, aware enough to know that he should be eating more and there's a problem versus he's just full. Um, but this is something to keep in the back of your mind as well. With that, I welcome it to questions. I just try to highlight things that will get you through getting small ruminants pregnant and lambed and kitted out. I can't see anybody, so I'm not quite uh, sure. <laughs> we're okay, it. we have a question, Paul. Uh, we need to talk for our comments about uh, selenium. Selenium. Selenium, whether it needs to be supplemented or not, and how, and uh, whether. Um, how it's related to reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, so selenium, um, it definitely has a role in their ability to get pregnant. Um, interestingly enough, the I don't know how many of you guys are using the the new blood, and I say new, it's probably almost five years old now. Um, the trace element panel you can do at Michigan State on the Royal Blue top tubes. Um, Interestingly enough, when we send that out, it rarely comes back selenium deficient in our animals. Um, so we preach this selenium deficiency, but I wonder how bad it really is. I mean, don't get me wrong, we occasionally have one that is selenium deficient, but it's not the degree that we claim it is. Um, I do think it's definitely important to repro. Um, what most of my clients are doing is uh, BOCI injections twice a year and that has been plenty of prophylaxis for it. Whether or not that's necessary, I I can't say. Um, but I haven't seen that many that much of a problem, which goes strongly against one of my former mentors who is preaches selenium deficiency. Again, it it exists. I don't think it's quite to the degree that we worry about. I think twice a year supplementation with injectable selenium and vitamin E is enough. I So I actually only give it to my newborn lambs. 
um, and then once a year to my female, my adults. What, and I well, have not had a problem. What about uh, the last month of pregnancy? Would that be a good time because the demand from the fetus? Is, yeah. So I mean, the, we get into this debate at our clinic frequently because the bottle <laughs> says not to be used in pregnant use. Um, but plenty of people have used it in pregnant use in the past. Um, I've never used it in a pregnant you, therefore I don't want to try it because the label says not to, but I know plenty of people who have. I know a lot of goat breeders do use it at the end just fine. I guess I don't have a firm stance on recommending it or not. My philosophy is give it right before breeding and that should carry you through a pregnancy. And then I give it um, while the lamb is in a jug. So she's that lamb's had it usually within 24 to 48 hours. And I've never had problems. What I actually see more problems with is copper deficiency in our small ruminants. And it, it looks like selenium deficiency to a degree. But they've never, when I test those, they never test low in selenium. Okay. Well, we have someone who wants to talk about selenium. Never give my adult selenium. Um, I have producers that want to give selenium all the time, and mostly I just don't fight with them about it. I kind of like did a little bit of a deep dive into research a couple of years ago, um, and like injectable selenium, at least in humans, when it's like radio tagged, it's like eliminated so much more fast, like more quickly. Um, when it's given as an injection like that, and I'm like, I don't know, is that why they're tolerating it really well? Where all these producers want to give all these selenium injections all the time. Um, I don't know. I, I don't fight with people about it who want to give it all the time, but I don't routinely give it to my own animals. They're pretty good at having babies. <laughs> I have the same stance. I know people who give it every month. Do you think that maybe because the uh, feed protocol is now, it's actually, and I think it's I have so like, many people are feeling like, from the dark ages. <laughs> in New England, you couldn't cab out in a cow without giving it to me. It's so also like so well conserved by the body, like there shouldn't be a good reason to lose it. Um, so uh, anything that's getting even like a negligible amount of some kind of mineral supplement with some minimal amount of selenium in it, I feel like they're probably okay. But I just don't fight with people about it. I'm just like, whatever. It's, mm. You're probably not hurting anything. Right. You you want to give your whole bunch of goats all these injections? All right. It's a hard a hard to push injection. Mm -hmm. Right. Another question. Oh, sorry. Um, about the copper deficiency part, are you doing uh, what te what testing are you doing for copper? Are you doing like liver samples or? Um. So in the baby lambs that have shown up, I have some great videos of lambs with enzootic ataxia. Um. Those ones I just did that royal blood, that royal blue top tube to Michigan State to prove it. Um, I have dealt with, actually, we just got one published this past week on a copper issue with sheep eating, chewing on um, pressure treated wood because it's pressure treated with copper, come to find out. I didn't know that. Um, those ones I did liver biopsies on, those were adults. And it's astonishing how long it hangs in the liver is what I've learned longer than we even read about. Um, but the, the newborn babies that are ataxic and they look like white muscle, but they're not weak, if that makes sense. They waste away in the hind end, but they can't use their hind end. Um, those have been the, the blood test at Michigan State. Um, and the reason I found in talking to the, the major feed company down in our area is so afraid of copper toxicity that they are adding molybdenum at, to their sheep feed at crazy amounts. So basically the people feeding a grain-based diet down here from that company are just depleting all and any copper in their sheep. Um, and this grain company, I've talked to them multiple times, they cannot be deterred from it because they're protecting themselves from a lawsuit. And that's how they figured out to do it for copper toxicity. Yep, another question. Well, um, that's pretty exciting for me to see you doing a C section on a goat under just a local block. Um, 
Was that, that was a drone where you, you had a unique technician holding it up on the head. That was there's no summation there, no, just a local block. Can you paraphrase that, Carol? I couldn't hear it all the way. Yeah, he wondered if uh, he was impressed that you didn't use a general anesthesia, it was local. I think you just did what you showed us was sheep, not goats, right? No, there was a goat. Okay. Oh, okay. So he was impressed and. Uh, that's the <laughs> they're usually the majority of the c-sections we do are pregnancy toxemia cases um so they're pretty weak and usually the person holding the head has a dose of injectable anesthesia so i use ket stun a ketorb xylosine mixture that can go im and it works like within minutes um i love it so they keep it on hand in case you know when the kids come out they feel better um, they can pop them if they need to, or if she's becoming too restless. Um, but uh, I can't think of one time I've actually put it in them. Um, if if it's something like a a really bright Nigerian dwarf who has a fetus in her that's just too big, I do typically put them under either general um, inhalants or some level of cat stun to go. Something that I can reverse in the fetus. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gailey. This has been pretty good. All right. And now I have, you have my slides. You're welcome to share. And if anybody else is interested, you can reach out. I have a handout on, I have a small ruminant parturition emergency guide, and I have a hypothermia guide. If anybody wants those, I'm happy to share them. All right. Yeah. We'll sum that out with material. Thank you so much for joining us. All righty. Have a good rest of the day. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.